Good morning, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us at our September Coffee with an Entrepreneur event featuring our guest entrepreneur, Marta Cortez of Eduardo's Mexican Restaurant. We're so excited to have her here today to share her story with you all, and we're so glad that you could join us here in person. Um, there's nothing like getting that live interaction and getting a chance to ask your questions of this seasoned entrepreneur. So in just a little bit, you will hear from her and you'll get your opportunity to ask some questions as well. But first, we would love to start with the Pledge of Allegiance. If you can all please rise. And Mayor Casillas, would you start, would you lead us please? Sure. Would you place your right hand over your heart? Ready, begin. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you so much. I'd also like to have a moment of silence for our military and our service members that we lost um, a couple of weeks ago in Afghanistan. So please join me in a moment of silence in recognition of their sacrifice. Thank you. So before we get started with our event today, um, I wanna again thank you all. We're doing this in partnership with the city of Corona. We've had this going for several years now and we've heard some fr from some really incredible entrepreneurs. And I would like to give you all an opportunity to introduce yourselves and who you are today. One of the best things about Chamber of Commerce events is that we get a chance to network and meet fellow business owners and community leaders. So I'll, take, I'll start. We're just doing names and um, companies. My name is Stephanie Shapiro, and I'm with the Corona Chamber of Commerce, and then we'll head around to this side of the room. Would you like to introduce yourself first? Oh, me? Yeah, you. Oh, uh, hi, I'm Anthony. I'm with the city of Corona. <laughs> uh, I'm with the community space fund. This is uh, Ben Marie, the community speaker. Thank you. Christy? Good morning, everyone. I'm Christy with CSI, Futurama Mafia Organization. Good morning, I'm Kathleen Kipitasa, Expression Point Professional from the uh, Chamber Board. In just the power of networking, I always really got good engagement from Toronto 15 years and I haven't met Marta until we joined the board together, so that's just a very dear friend to bring you to Toronto. Thank you. Wonderful. Scott? Uh, Ross Mayer, I'm with the Toronto Discovery Club and the Toronto Chamber Foundation. Thank you. Jason Scott. Good morning, I'm Jackie Casillas, I'm serving as your mayor this year, and uh, I'm with Steve Marketing. Good morning, Paula Montanez, Allegra Marketing Personnel, and Industry 65. Good morning, I'm Drew Montanez, Allegra Marketing Personnel, and Industry 65. Sign, which is not a very good one. But former council member, former mayor. And um, I'm Mary Paxton, I am retired, I've been in Florida 30 years, and I'm a former mayor. Wonderful. We'll introduce you officially and momentarily, but do you want to tell everybody who you are? <laughs> Wonderful. And I'm so happy to have so many of our elected officials here today, um, community leaders. You guys really make this city go round. I see volunteers and um, just really appreciate you all. I have a few announcements to make. You'll notice in front of you, you have a copy of Corona Business News. That is our September, October edition. Um, it's the the latest publication that we have, and we have some advertising space available in there. I can't believe we're almost at the end of the year. So uh, November, December is underway now, and if you have any questions about that, you can see Tammy, who uh, introduced herself already, if you can give a wave, Tammy. 
That's cool. <laughs> <laughs> um, also, we're a social uh, chamber of commerce here, and we want to encourage you guys to be social, grab your phones, take a selfie with a friend, take a picture of Marta while she's up here, share that you're here today, uh, make sure to use hashtags Corona Chamber and City of Corona so that we can find those and share those later as well. Also inside of those packets um, of the newspaper, you have some flyers with you. One of them is the Women's Leadership Conference. This is our 10th annual and it's in partnership with the County of Riverside. We're gonna have a lot of really dynamic speakers, 10, 10 talks we actually have, along with a special message, <coughs> pardon me, from our County Supervisor, who's the founder of the conference, and a healthcare panel as well. That's coming up later this month on September 30th and we would love for you to join us. At this time, I would like to introduce our partner for today's event, Jessica Gonzalez, Economic Development Director for the City of Corona, to share some announcements with you as well. Please welcome Jessica. Well, good morning, everyone. Once again, pleasure to be here. We're always very excited when we can hear amazing stories. And so, Marta, I think all of us are looking forward to hearing about your journey. So what we do in the city of Corona, we always aim to support our entrepreneurs, our business community to create those bridges, provide those resources that are going to help them. So we are fortunate to have the great support of our mayor, council, that allows us to bring forth these resources, webinars of interest. So this Wednesday, for those that don't know, we kick off Hispanic Heritage Month across the nation. And so this is a great way for us to lead into the month by hearing directly from Marta, successful Latino entrepreneur here in Corona. And we also are partnering with other agencies to be able to celebrate across the month. So this afternoon, for those that are available and speak Spanish or would love to learn Spanish, at 5 p.m. we are also partnering with Grow with Google. So we all know Google very well. They have a branch specifically dedicated to building inclusivity, helping entrepreneurs to be able to launch business concepts, bring those to reality. 5 p.m., you can go on the city's website, coronaca.gov, to learn more. It's the first of a three-part series. Today it starts on the 13th at 5 p.m. We'll continue on September 20th, and also on October 11th, it will conclude. Helping businesses, specifically our Hispanic-owned businesses and dis aspiring entrepreneurs, to understand how to market their business, how to be able to use search engine optimizations effectively, and of course, how to attract customers to their place of business. Also next week, want to point out that we are partnering with our Corona Chamber of Commerce and the Inland Empire Procurement Technical Assistance Center on a government contracting seminar. And so we know sometimes we hear from our business community that they would like to understand how to compete for government contracts, how to assess if they're ready. This seminar is going to do just that, help you to understand and assess your capabilities and get ready to be able to compete for those government contracts across county, state, federal branches of government. So next Tuesday from 1.30 to 3 p.m., online webinar. The information is also available on the Chamber website, <coughs> pardon me, and also on the City website. So we have many events throughout the year that are designed to empower our business community, and we look forward to seeing you at all of them. Thank you. Today's event. <laughs> yeah. Martha is 
Christine Darrow, manager of uh, and co-owner of Eduardo Mexican Restaurant. She uh, Eduardo is owned and operated by Marta and her siblings, and they have served in the Big Sur area since 1994. Mm -hmm. She also serves on the board for the Kenya Chamber of Commerce and is part of our committee for the Riverside County Women's Leadership Conference. She is very passionate about serving the community and especially about reaching underserved communities here in Corona and beyond. And we are so excited to have her here today. And at this time, I'd like to help me welcome Marta Cortez. they did they you know they they gave us the opportunity to live in this country to um, do whatever we wanted and, and be as successful as we wanted to be you know and 
they really, really work hard on that. Um, I'm the youngest of six, and I have to point out I'm a lot younger than all of them. <laughs> so if any of them would say differently, they're lying, okay? So um, I know one of my brothers will always say, oh no, I'm the youngest, and people actually believe him. <laughs> you know, I'm like, mm, I won't <laughs> So, um, uh, you know, we're three boys, three girls. My oldest brother has since passed away. But my second brother, Salvador, was the big entrepreneur in the family. He was always looking to do something. Um, and this is since I was a kid, I remember him doing things. He was in a band. He, um, he worked in a radio station. He was a, a DJ in a radio, Spanish radio station. He um, opened up a club slash nightclub bar with his friends. Um, they played live Spanish music. This this feels like another life ago, because like I said, I was I was a kid when all this was going on. Um, but he was always looking to do something, and he had a lot of successes in those businesses, and we had a lot of failures too. But I always was there to help. I mean, it was exciting just to be involved in something. I remember, I think I was 14 maybe, when they had some radio event and I got to help and got paid. So that was exciting. Um, but he also, you know, he, he always tried to improve himself. He, would, he went to school, he went to RCC, he studied business, he studied photography, you know, and he always pushed all of us to do the same. He pushed me to go to school. He bought me my car when I was in college so that I was able to travel, you know, to school and back because I first I started, you know, on the bus. Um, he encouraged my other brother also to go to school, which he did. And, you know, he just pushed us all. So, um, he he was, he's responsible for me speaking and writing good Spanish, because he always pushed that also. You know, he, he taught me to be proud of where I came from, <coughs> my language, my culture, you know, my history. So that, that really stayed with me a lot. Um, he, he, and he always managed to pull us into whatever he was doing. You know, by working there. I mean, he would even get my dad involved at the at the nightclub they had. My dad would. Be, you know, my dad was old, retired, <laughs> and he's at a bar, <laughs> working at the bar. So, um, so that always was instilled with me in me to work with the family to help to to you know to move forward. Um, like I said, he pushed me to go to college. And I graduated from Corona High. And I did, it, while I was in Corona High, I studied, studied cosmetology. This is something that not too many people know about me. Mm -hmm. But I was a cosmetologist and it helped out, you know, while I went to college. Um, after that, I attended RCC and then transferred to UCR. I graduated from UCR in 1994 with a bachelor's in, in sociology, and I was supposed to go to law school after that. That was my goal. But remember how I said my brother pulled us all into whatever business he was doing? <laughs> well, that kind of changed my course. Um, when, I think it was in 1993, they opened up a restaurant. Him and my other, my two brothers opened up a restaurant in uh, Pomona. And it went through some name changes and it ended at the end, it was uh, Eduardo's Mexican restaurant. But it was a bad location, very bad location. So it, it was a big flop. And we ended up closing it in May of 1994. So closed the restaurant then. I graduated from college the next month. And at the same time, Trina's here in Corona. Anybody remember Trina's? That's the location where we're at. That's the restaurant that was there before. They they closed.
closed and he got you know into talks with the owner and also the landlord and made a deal and we bought out the restaurant and you know we were ready to start something new and they were broke i had just got out, gotten out of college there wasn't that much money so the only thing we really had was our work so we were there you know getting the place ready i remember i had to spray paint the chairs that we were going to use because they were the wrong color um you know we were doing all the work and then when we finally opened we were there every day every day all day um the restaurant they had in Pomona was a big learning lesson but it was an expensive learning lesson but I think by the time we opened up the restaurant here, we all knew what we wanted. We wanted fresh food, authentic food. We wanted to provide, you know, a good family atmosphere um, for our customers. And we sat down, we came up with the menu, we opened. I remember we opened on a Saturday afternoon and within half an hour, we had a first customer. We never, we didn't advertise. We, uh, I think all we had was a sign outside that said coming soon, but you know, we never advertised when we were gonna open or had a big event, it was on the down low. Mm -hmm. And we had our first customer within half an hour and we had a busy afternoon. So that was great. Um, Funny story, before um, we opened for Catholic, we had the priest from St. Edward's come in and, and bless the restaurant. So we became really good friends with them. And we never made the connection on the name, you know, Eduardo <laughs> and St. Edward's around the corner, but a lot of people did. And they thought we were part of the church. So that was a big, you know, <laughs> we're like, no. It, because we had had the other restaurant in Pomona that was named the same. So, of course, we used the same name. But, yeah, we're like, oh, okay, this is good. And then the priest would give us big shout outs at the end of Mass and tell everyone to go to the restaurant. So that was definitely good for our first year, especially. Um, Again, people would assume we were part of the church because he was, you know, promoting the restaurant. <laughs> so we're like, sure. So he was a, he was definitely a blessing, um, and that helped us, you know, build our clientele the first year. Um, so anyway, so we were there, you know, working every day from open to close. We did everything. I remember cooking, cleaning, washing dishes, whatever had to be done. We did, you know, and um, I think the first year we lived off of our tips because we had no money to pay ourselves. So we basically lived off the tips, which, you know, got us through. I remember it, there was hard times. We had a, an old van <coughs> that we used and it said Eduardo's on the sides. It's like a really old van. And one night we were <coughs> gonna go home. And for some reason, that's the only car we had there. So we were all gonna get in the van and go home. And my nieces and nephews were there with us. And it was a stick shift, because it was really old. <laughs> and it wouldn't start. So my brother had the great idea of, let's roll it down the street and push it and get it started on Merrill know where the restaurant is it's kind of downhill so you know we kept pushing we went past fifth street fourth street <laughs> by the time we got to third street we're like okay it's not gonna start <laughs> so we all ended up walking home <laughs> which you know was funny we were laughing about it on the way home not only did we have to walk from the restaurant home after a long day but we had a walk from further down because we had pushed it so far down but anyways those are kind of like some of the experiences we had in the beginning um, like I said we were there all day we didn't have a life 
and then that was the time where there was beepers. Anybody had a beeper back then? <laughs> okay, so the good thing about that is one of us could leave for a while, and if you had your beeper on you and you got beeped, that meant get your ass back in here. <laughs> because we're busy and we need your help. But that's the only way we could get away for a while. So that was definitely, I remember being at the store somewhere and I'd get the beep and I'm like, oh crap, really just ignore it, you know. <laughs> but no, I never did that. Or at least I've never admitted to it. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, you know, there was hard times and I think the first time we actually got a check, it was for $32 once things got better. I remember getting that first check. We were so excited. Not because of the money, but because we were at the point where we were actually making a profit. Or not necessarily a profit, but at least enough money for us to take something. And then eventually, you know, we started doing better um, within the years and things got better. And we just kept going. Um, in 1999, we decided to open a second restaurant in Riverside. And we had a location on your University Avenue in between um, Chicago and Iowa. And we opened up another restaurant. It was a bigger restaurant, so we decided to use, uh, have a different name. It was called Don Pedro Mexican Restaurant, and named after my dad. And we opened in 2000. Well, it was um, it was a nice place, but it was a very big restaurant, so it required a lot of money just to keep it going. And at that point, that area was in transition. It was before they did all the student housing, the additional student housing and all of that. So I think we were there before it became a good area. So it, it didn't do well. You know, we eventually closed in 2004. And I know they say most restaurants fail within the first year. 90% of restaurants fail within the first year. And that's actually not true. It's more like 17%. But 90% of restaurants do fail within the first five years. So that was between that time frame. You, if you get through the five year mark, you're probably going to make it way past that. So that was only four years that we were open. We were almost there, but I think we were there before we should have been there. Um, after that, you know, we've gone through other periods of downturns like the Great Recession and then with COVID last year. It was, it was, it's been a difficult time. I think for most business owners, but specifically for restaurants, because we were so limited in what we could do with takeout. And understandably, we were very careful also uh, because of our staff. We wanted to protect them. Uh, the Hispanic community has been hit very hard with COVID because a lot of us work in service jobs and in um, industries that where we have a lot of contact with people and um, you know there's other factors that play into it but we wanted to make sure our staff was protected so we actually closed for two months to begin with we, you know so we just we wanted to see what was going to happen and then we reopened for takeout um, had very strict procedures and you know um, to protect the staff. We didn't open until everyone had the opportunity to get vaccinated. We drove employees to get their vaccine. We made appointments for them. You know, we didn't force anyone, but everyone pretty much got the vaccine. And we wanted to reopen once everyone was protected. So that's that's been very important for us, our staff. Um, we have a one, wonderful staff. We have people that have been there 10, 15, 20 years. We had um, one of our main cooks retired after 20 years. She started working with us the first week we opened. And, you know, we have, we, we don't have high turnover. And I think um, we have a good, very good team. 
everybody's invested in the success of the restaurant and they take pride, you know, in in putting out a good product and good service. Um, I think the restaurant business is one of the most complex businesses there is. It, and I'm not saying that because I'm in the restaurant, but there are so many components to a restaurant that, and there's so many moving parts constantly that it, I don't think we would have been able to do it if there wasn't five of us. Mm -hmm. I think it's for one person or two people, it's it's a lot more difficult. We, um, as you can see, my siblings aren't here. <laughs> they hate anything any attention, which I used to not like either, but I put myself out there more, but they didn't want to be here. They, they were afraid I was going to call on them. <laughs> <laughs> they're like, no, no, good luck. You do this. <laughs> so, yeah, I can't get them to go to events or anything because, you know, they're, we're very private. We're a very private family. Uh, well, except for me, I'm kind of a <laughs> black sheep of the family in a lot of ways. Um, so, you know, but we all have our areas of expertise that we focus on, you know, besides the general running of the restaurant. Um, like I said, Salvador was the big entrepreneur and he play, put in place a lot of our procedures and, you know, things like that. My sister, Adela, is the best cook ever. Like, I don't know how she does it. She, I think she inherited it from my mom because my mom was always... A, a very good cook. She, um, like, people would come over and she'd just serve beans and they would, like, rave over her beans. And I'm like, they're just beans. You know, but she, you know, if they're not perfect, they're not that good. It, it, it can be the simplest recipe. And simple is sometimes a lot better than throwing in a lot of, you know, seasoning and stuff. The simpler, when it comes to Mexican food, is usually better. Um, but she has the touch. She can eat something and figure out what's in it. You know, I'm more of a cook in theory. I know how to do things. I know the procedures. I know the ingredients. I know everything, but in practice, I'm not that great. <laughs> you know, I stick to other things. Um, I'm a good taster, though. I can always <laughs> tell when something is good or there's something missing. I will always tell her, that's not right. There's something missing or there's something, you know, out of balance. And then she'll go look at it and she'll be like, oh, it was missing this or it had too much this. So we make a good team. I eat, she cooks. <laughs> um, and then Mary is good with staff. Like, she cracks the whip, you know. She's very good. Um, what in, in a restaurant, one of the biggest expenses is is labor. And if you don't, if you aren't on top of it every hour, every day, it can really eat up your, your profit margin, which to begin with is not that big. So you have to be on top of that. Um, it's especially here in California. It's, it's one of our bigger expenses more than product and Especially at Eduardo's we cook everything fresh, you know, we Don't buy any sauces pre-made frozen. We don't freeze anything. Everything's made every day or every two days or however needed But everything is fresh so the labor is a lot more you know, a lot of restaurants buy a lot of frozen, pre-made, so they they have a higher food cost and less labor cost. Ours is the other way around. So um, that's she's very good at that. And then there's Eduardo, who, of course, the restaurant is named after him. Um, and the reason it's named after him is just we all kind of figured it was the nicer name. Like, not because he's special or anything, <laughs> but we're just like, okay, what name do we use? And we ended up using his. So, yeah. 
we remind him of that a lot. <laughs> <laughs> um, so um, he does a lot for maintenance, he does the purchasing, he does inventory, stuff like that. I do, I do, what do I do? I do, uh, I'm out and about a lot. <laughs> I do um, part of the books, especially uh, our bookkeeper took some time off through COVID, so I kind of got back into that. But I had always been, I hated being in the rest, in, in the dining room. I've always been very shy, very um, not outgoing, definitely. Mm -hmm. I'm more introverted. And it was a big challenge for me to put myself out there. I like it now, you know. But um, it was a big challenge because I, I was not very social. And... Um, but it's really changed me a lot, so that's good. But um, I do a lot of the, you know, the uh, social marketing. I do, um, like I said, our books, and just uh, we all do the every day to day. We take turns, so you know, there's all that. And especially now uh, that there's such a labor shortage, we have been struggling to get, you know, a full staff once we reopen. So we're all putting, you know, extra hours, doing a lot of things that I hadn't done for a long time. So, you know, it's it's good. It gets you back into the day to day. And, um, but, you know, we'll see. Hopefully we'll be able to get more staff soon. Um, there's, like I said, there's a lot of parts to running a restaurant. There's, you have to be careful with your food costs, your labor costs, like I said. Um, there's health and sanitation that is very important. Um, you have people's health in your hands, basically, because if you're not careful and you don't follow, you know, adequate processes in handling the food and cooking the food, in storing it, you can get someone sick, you know, and, and so that's very important too. Um, there's a, a lot, you, you know, you have to deal with staffing and labor law, so that's another aspect too that's very important to a restaurant. Um, a lot of people will ask us, or they'll say, you know, I love to cook, and I'm a good cook, and people love my food. And I'm thinking about opening a restaurant. And I'm like, no, don't do it. <laughs> the last thing you need to know is how to cook to run a restaurant. You need to know so much more. You know, you can always hire a cook, but there's so much more that you have to be on top of to, to run the day to day. Um, it's, not a, it's not something where you can turn a hobby into a business. Because believe me, you, if you enjoy cooking, the last thing you want to do is open up a restaurant because you'll hate cooking it. <laughs> you know, it's 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 very different. Um, so, you know, it doesn't hurt to n have the knowledge in the kitchen, but but that you can't be there, to, you know, the the whole day and not deal with the other aspects of the business. So, um, you know, like I said, we it, the food has always been part of family businesses and in our culture you show your love and appreciation through food so you know my mom will still send me food to the restaurant like I'm surrounded by food <laughs> and she still sends me something she cooked because that's her way of showing me you know she loves me so I love it you know as long as she can keep doing it I'll take it um, and then you get, you know, you get sick of eating the same thing every day for 27 years, <laughs> even if it is the bottom. <laughs> you know. uh, so we've learned through her how to take care of people with food. So we, you know, we, it makes us happy. It makes us happy to see people happy once they're, they eat the food. Um, I always tell the staff, always keep in mind that when people come in, they're hangry. They're angry because they're hungry. 
And your job is to change that, to make sure that when they leave, they're happy, they're satisfied. You know, if, if someone leaves unhappy, like, we, we failed. We failed our mission. So that's always a priority. You know, put up with a little bit at the beginning because they're hungry and, you know, we all get a little bit, I don't know, just angry or just, you know, unhappy when we're hungry, like little kids. <laughs> and um, so that's, that's definitely something we instill in the staff to, to you know, take care of our customers. Um, when you're serving people, it's a very personal interaction, a very personal um, relationship because you're engaging many of their senses, vision, taste, and smell. That's three out of five. So you need to make sure that you satisfy all three of them for them to be happy. So if the food doesn't look good, if it doesn't smell good, if it doesn't taste good, you failed. So all three matter. Um, that's a, a basic, you know, to keeping a customer happy. Of course, customer service also. But those are those are primary. And then after their first visit, you also have to deal with the memory of their last visit. You know, if their last visit was good, you need to make sure this one is up to par. Make sure it's as satisfying as the first one. So, so there's 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 a lot there that you have to do to keep a customer happy. Like I said, our mission is to make sure our our customers are happy. Um, and through that interaction, we get to know our customers very well. We uh, There's a lot of them that we know by name. We know what they eat, we know what they order. You know, we know their families. We have customers that we've known for 27 years, that have been going there for 27 years. I have one family where, right when we opened, we catered their wedding. And then about 17 years later, we catered their twin daughter's quinceanera. And now last year, one of the girls got married, so we catered the wedding. And then their youngest daughter, who is, I believe, 14, said she's having her quinceanera next year, so we better be ready for that. <laughs> so, you know, it's nice to be part of all of that. It's very satisfying. Unfortunately, we do also become part of their losses and their sorrows. Um, there's another family who has been going there again since we opened and the grandson just passed away at a very young age, I think 19. So seeing them go through that has been very hard. He was, you know, he died in a tragic situation. So, you know, but at least we get to be there for the family and comfort them as much as we can. Uh, wish we could do more, but you know, that's what we can do. Uh, so a lot of customers have become good friends also. Uh, you know, there's different aspects to a restaurant. Like I said, quality is number one. Um, I had a customer, we had a family come in yesterday and they hadn't been to the restaurant in 15 years because they had moved away. And they were excited because they were bringing in their kids. Their kids hadn't been there since they were little and now they're adults. And they were excited because they wanted to show their kids where they used to come when they were young. And, you know, at the end they said, it tasted as good as we remembered. So, you know, it, it, it's important to have a lot of consistency in food. Um, it, it, you can have different cooks, but everybody has to cook the same way in order to remain consistent. So, but, um, cooks tend to want to cook their way because it's better. They think it's better, but, you know, we always teach them how to cook. Everything the same. A customer should not be able to tell who cooked it, if it was this cook or that cook. It should always be the same. Um, like I said, everything in the restaurant is made with fresh ingredients. Uh, we don't skimp on quality. 
we don't serve anything, we would not serve our family. That's that's the big test right there. Would you serve that to your guests at home or your family? If not, we can't serve it at the restaurant. If I won't eat it, I won't serve it. We do try to uh, keep everything as authentic as possible. We we uh, we use fa modified family recipes because they're um, uh, you have to modify them for you know for it's different when you cook at home for your family or when you cook a big batch um, and we keep our entrees as as um, authentic as possible or we try there's some compromises we have to make because people are used to certain things so you know but we try to compromise as little as possible mm -hmm. um, so yeah those are you know basic information about running the restaurant um, marketing I know we were talking about Google having you know the sessions about Google and stuff uh, we've never done a lot of marketing most of ours has been word of mouth we're very fortunate from the very beginning we did try doing some coupons and stuff but we realized that um, coupons weren't a good thing uh, it undervalues what you're serving because people will get used to the coupon and then don't come in unless they have a coupon so if you can have good or you can have cheap you can't have both and we like to have good instead of cheap there's a lot of places that have cheap um, we do catering we do um, the biggest I've done I think is 800 people but we can pretty much cook anything in the restaurant you know for catering for big groups uh, so that's that's um, about it about the restaurant. I just want to, I know we're running a little bit late. No, we're okay. 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 So I do want to talk about my community service because that's my passion. I mean, the restaurant is my passion again. I'm not saying it's not. But um, my community service is very important to me, and that's what's gotten me out and more in public. Um, I, I love to give back, I love to make a difference. Um, I feel that you have to get involved. We all have to get involved in the community in some way or another. We can't just complain about how things are. We, if we want change, we need to participate and make change. I serve on the chamber board. Um, I like that I bring a, a different view to the table. I think a lot of our Latino businesses or business people focus a lot on the business or in the business and not so much on on the business and expanding and learning and engaging the business community so I I would love to to be you know to help change that and that's one of the reasons I'm here um, I know we're doing this in Spanish at 10 o'clock and it's the first time we were ever doing one in Spanish so so that's you know I'm very happy about that I'm dancing <laughs> I'm also on the board of the Corona History Association. I, again, history is very important and we have to preserve it, we have to tell it, we have to share it, the good and the bad, because we learn from both. Um, we can't just share the good because it makes us feel good. We have to share the bad. And the Latino community has, has been a big part of Corona for a long time. And you know, sometimes that part of the story doesn't get told. So I like to, I, I, I want that to be more out there and everyone to know about it. One of my favorite books is Raina Gold. Has anybody oh, read yeah. Raina Gold? Yeah. Yes, that's one of my favorite books because it, it talks a lot about Corona. There's a lot of, the, the great part of the story happens in Corona. So read that if you've never read it by uh, Rafael Villaseñor. Yeah. I'm, I'm also on the Cinco de Mayo committee. I, um, I had some issues with Cinco de Mayo growing up in a traditional Mexican family because Cinco de Mayo is not celebrated in Mexico. It's not a holiday, it's not anything, but here it's a big thing. It's like, I don't know, it's like Independence Day, but it's 
not. <laughs> I, I had some issues with that and I had to make peace with it. I learned. It's more of a Chicano um, holiday, a Mexican American holiday. So in Mexico, we always say, why do you celebrate Cinco de Mayo? And before I'd be like, I don't know. It's just there, you know? But then I learned about it. I learned the history of it, and, and I'm okay with it. I'm good with celebrating it. And then the Cinco de Mayo committee, um, we have a big event, a parade, and an event at the park. So it, I love sharing my culture and my heritage. And um, as you see, I brought you guys pan dulce because I thought coffee without pan dulce, yeah. you know, no, not not if I, you know, not if a Mexican speaking. Um, and we do, uh, we raise funds for scholarships for Corona Norco Unified School District for all the high schools. We do at least three scholarships. And you don't have to be a Latino to apply for the scholarship. Anybody can. Um, I'm also on the uh, YMCA board. And again, another organization that serves the underserved community. The Y does a lot of good things. I was recently at the Teen Center and Home Gardens. and. Boy, what I would have done, you know, to have that kind of a, a place to go to when I was young. My parents were busy working. You know, I did, when I was a teen, I didn't have that support to help me, you know, move forward, go to college. Although I did have, when, when I was in school, there was a program that I participated in, and it was called the Migrant Program, and it was a, a program for, um, for kids that were kids of uh, people working in the agriculture industry. So that was a big thing for me. That's what helped me want to go to college. They would take us on college tours. I participated in a program where I went to the University of San Diego for six weeks one summer when I was 14. Um, and that was a wonderful experience because we lived in the dorms, you know. I was 14 and we're living in the dorms with our, our parents. Mm -hmm. So that was, you know, pretty amazing. We got um, school credits for it. it. It was just, you know, it, it was very good. They, 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 like I said, they helped me want to move forward and go to college. So all those programs are important. Um, I'm also on the board, last one, of the Herencia Mariachi Academy, which is a mariachi school here in Corona. It is um, a, a school started by parents. I came in, you know, about three years after they opened. <coughs> and they teach kids, they teach music, they teach how to read it, they teach how to play the different instruments, they teach them stage presence. Um, we also uh, promote going on to higher education, and a lot of our students had have gone on like last year we had I believe it was six and we were able to give them some funding for their you know college which was you know that was also good um, we have a top-notch musical director he actually played with the best uh, mariachi in Mexico for 20 years and so he is uh, he recorded with Linda Ronstadt and some other Latin art, important artists. And um, so that that's that school is doing a really great work. Um, as you can see, most of my, my things I participate in, um, I, I want to bring more, um, I don't know, integrate our community a little bit better. Bring, bring all parts of our community and together and and hopefully eventually all the kids will have the same opportunity everybody will have the same opportunity and we'll have more diversity in general um, so that's my passion right there um, that's where I hope you know to make make a difference besides feeding people good food mm -hmm. um, so anyways I think that's all about me. So, Mark, let's give her a round of applause. I'm going to start off with a question, and then please, if you guys have questions, I'd ask you to repeat it so that 
Facebook can catch it, capture it. But I, I, I want to start off with a comment. The blessing from the priest, I think that is awesome to put your faith in there. Um, and not a coincidence that Eduardo's in St. Edward's. That's that's from above, I am sure. So It was a mess. Yeah. <laughs> but but I love yeah. how you get involved and you help so many nonprofits. You also help a lot of businesses with catering. I recall you shared with me, you had like someone called you and they were in panic mode. They needed 200 to feed 200 people. Like they gave you two hours notice. You made it happen. Mm -hmm. Share on that, but also what is your most unique <coughs> request, either from the restaurant or for catering or whatever that you can share with everyone? Okay, yeah. Yeah, that happened about a couple months ago. I had a friend call me and said, I need help. Um, his ex-wife had hired someone on Facebook to cater and they never showed up. So yeah, don't hire someone on Facebook. <laughs> <laughs> and he said, I need food for 200 in two hours. And I'm like, okay. Luckily, it wasn't a crazy busy day at the restaurant, and we were able to focus on that. Otherwise, I don't know if we would have been able to do it. But you know, we served a little. We gave them a little bit of this, a little bit of that, and you know, made a bunch of enchiladas and had them on his way in, two, in about two hours, fifteen minutes. So, so yeah, that was that was a crazy one. <laughs> We've had some crazy ones, but that was that was a crazy one. Um, I don't know the most unique requests or uh, sometimes they'll come and ask for things that are, aren't on the menu. Um, someone came in and asked me if I could do Italian food. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, and I'm like, no. And they're like, oh, but it's easy. And I'm like, okay, well, you do it. <laughs> you know? uh, um, we've had, um, like I said, there's some there's some weird ones. Um, I had a friend who got married and we catered her, her wedding and it was outside and it was the hottest day of the year. And it was crazy. Um, the the um, wedding planner was not much of a wedding planner and I actually had to step up and bring in staff to help serve, extra staff to help serve. And he was just going to like on the day of the event. And um, you know, I did that in part because it was a friend and. I didn't want her to have to deal with that on her wedding, so I took care of it and then just told her after she came back from <laughs> her honeymoon. I told her, go on your honeymoon, honeymoon and we'll talk later. But yeah, there's some situations there that are kind of crazy. Um, so we'll open up for questions. Please feel free. Okay, Kim. What dish are you most famous for? That's a hard one. Uh, actually, um, what dish is Eduardo's most famous for? It's a hard one because um, we sell everything. Like everything sells really well. Like for example, definitely our carne asada is very popular. Whether it's the plate, whether it's the burritos or tacos or whatever, um, we serve a very good quality cut um, that you won't find at many. And, um, but then like our carnitas are very popular. They're from the state where my parents are from. So it's a very popular dish there at the restaurant also. We sell a lot of soups. And even in the summer with this heat, we sell a lot of soups. Um, one of my favorites is chile rellenos. I love chile rellenos. They're a pain in the butt to make, but they're delicious. And Eugene? Have you, two things, have you had very many customers that have been very irate? I know people are saying in restaurants right now that customers are very short-tempered. And then on the other hand, have you had customers leaving bigger tips? Yes, on both. Repeat. Um, oh, um, if we've had, Eugene asked if we've had customers that are, are, are irate, you know, more upset uh, because we're short-staffed and you know all the different measures we have to take and then he also asked if there's customers who have left leave a bigger tip and yes on both we have um during COVID, during the shutdown when we were only open for takeout and we did require masks we would get we would get yelled at a lot the staff was was handling a lot of stuff there so and, and even now um like I said, we're short-staffed and people really don't understand how much, how hard
hard the staff is working and they're still want it now. You know, they don't want to wait. They don't think they want this. Or we're still working on a limited menu and limited schedule and they don't understand why. Um, but I'll be honest, most of our customers are wonderful. Those are very few. Um, people during, when we were closed, people were asking, always asking us, how are you doing? Are you hanging in there? You know, and yes, bigger tips for the staff. Definitely, even for just takeout. Um, so we do have wonderful customers. Like that's that's like the like ninety five percent of the people, and uh, and yet they're still leaving big tips for the staff. And um, there, when we closed, when we were closed for takeout, the staff that we had working, we made sure, you know, they had their salary pre COVID, their pre COVID salary, even though they weren't working as much because we wanted to make sure that they were taken care of. So, so yes. Jackie? Um, thank you for sharing your story. Thank you for all the great work that you do in the community. Um, and thank you for taking all those precautions during COVID. You didn't, I know you didn't have to. Um, you went above and beyond and some people keeping us safe. Um, my question is, you know, and I've seen it in my own family, uh, anecdotally at least, um, a lot of Latino businesses are based in, in family and family still works and not just establishes but is part of mm -hmm. the everyday. Um, can you speak a little bit to that? Do you think that's a strength? Do you think any thoughts on why that is? Um, and if you if there's any weaknesses to it, I'd love to hear that too. <laughs> that was long. Sorry. <laughs> okay, she's asking about the strengths and weaknesses of working with family. Yeah. Basically. Um, it's difficult. It can get difficult. I, I do know that, especially in my family, we were so united that it was kind of natural. My sisters quit their job to help my brothers in the restaurant they had in Pomona, and I was still in school and helping out. Um, and I was only going to be there for a year, you know, but I ended up staying for, I don't know if it was good or bad, but that's what happened. And um, it's been a difficult journey, I can say. It's hard to separate family and work. We end up talking about work at home and family at work. We try hard to separate, but it, you can't, you can't separate everything. And it can make or break a family. Um, we've had our, our difficult times. But in a way, it is a strength because we know we can rely on each other. We know we're all working towards the same goal. And, you know, like I said, I don't think we would have been able to do it if it was just two of us. You know, I think that's one of the things that has helped us all is that there's several of us. And not all of us are at 100% all the time. So when some aren't, we've gone through our rough periods some of us and even when my, my we lost my dad and my brother in the same year and that was very hard for everyone and I can say that the staff totally stepped up for us um, because my dad got diagnosed with cancer and he was home for five weeks after that and we spent every day with him and the staff completely stepped up there and he had a lot of support in the community also. So it can go either way. Oh, um, Nate. Um, my question is for, what advice would you give for the younger adults that do want to get into the food industry or like want to open up a restaurant? <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> no, it's good to start young. If you, that's what you want to do, you need to learn every aspect of it. We actually have an employee right now very hard working and he wants to open up his restaurant, his own restaurant eventually. And he's worked as a cook, he's worked at different positions and he asks a lot of questions. He's learning from us and you know, that's awesome. If, you know, eventually he opens up his restaurant, that's great. But he's taking it slowly, you know. Um, he, he doesn't have a plan to do it within a certain amount of years. He wants to make sure he knows everything also going to business school so so you know that's good you you can learn a lot from the different positions um, Stephanie what 
is the biggest thing that you would attribute your success to and what kept you going after the hard times? Um, I think one of the reason why we have had the biggest success is the quality of the food. Um, we're picky eaters. My whole family, we're picky eaters, you know. Uh, we grew up with my mom's cooking, so that's what we compare everything to. So we can pick apart a menu, and yet not in a good way. And we're picky, and like I said, we will not serve something we won't eat, or we won't feed our family. So I think that has been our biggest success, part of our why we've had success is um, we're always on top of the quality. And what was the other part? What keeps you going after the hard times? What keeps us going during, after the hard times? Um, just family, I think. Just and, and, and the response of our customers, even though we've gone through our times during the recession and now COVID, we still have some, a lot of support, you know, like our customers asking us, if they, even now they'll, they'll, they'll come in and say, oh, we're so happy you're open. We were worried about you, mm -hmm. you know? Um, so all of that is definitely very, very heart, heartwarming. And, and just knowing that people are happy with the food you know, if you make someone happy, that's very satisfying. Anybody else? Got time for one more question. Well, so are you going to consider maybe expanding to any more restaurants? You dabbled <laughs> with it? Um, we have discussed it. We don't have anything certain right now, but we have discussed it. Awesome. Um, well, I just want to thank everyone for coming. Thank you and for you. listening to me. Wonderful job. Thank you so much, Marta, for sharing your story. As she mentioned during her talk, she's going to be doing this again at 10 o'clock this morning in Spanish. So feel free to stick around for that and or get on the phone and make a call. Make sure everybody knows that she's doing that. We did record today's session both from the city and on Facebook Live, and we will be recording the 10 a.m. session as well. So thank you so much for sharing your story and your expertise with us. Um, we can't, uh, we just can't thank you enough for that. Thank you. I'm very, um, it's a privilege to be here and to share. Wonderful. And again, next month we'll be back October 11th with Chad Willardson. Um, if you notice, right behind Marta, there is a banner that shows our historic civic center. If you didn't have a chance to go there on Saturday, we have some flags up. Um, they will be up through Friday morning at, at 9 a.m. We'll start taking them down. That's in remembrance of those who lost their lives on 9-11. Um, and again, thank you so much to the city for making that event happen um, along with the chamber. So, class dismissed. <laughs>